why are so many of you here? Um, hi, I'm Tom. I'm a Python developer and a Django user and a security consultant. Uh, I've been using Python for about 15 years and Django for about 10, and I'm here to talk to you about eh, the world we live in and how it really works, no matter how you might wish otherwise. Um, oh, this is annoying. This is actually showing me the wrong version of my notes. I am going to do one thing very quickly. I'm going to refresh that. I'm going to close that. I'm going to push that button, and I'm going to steal that back. And that's better. Cool. Who's had a good conference so far? Who's had a great week? Hey. Who's looking forward to coming, going back to work on Monday? Hypothetical question. You get back from LCA, you've learned a lot, you've had a great time, and you are told on Monday that while you were here, your website got hacked into. On a scale of one to 10, how do you feel? Where either end is kind of crap. <laughs> um, so what if you get back and you're told that you were hacked into six months ago and they only found out just now? How do you feel? A little worse, a little worse, yeah. Worse is probably going to be the definitive answer. Um, that's good, I like that. The, the sort of hysterical. <laughs> so, people usually, so people usually get pretty nervous when that thought experiment is, is presented with them. And it's usually that they're nervous because they haven't really thought about it yet. It's not so much that they know what they would do or don't know what they would do. It's just that it's never even occurred to them. Um, at least not beyond, please don't let this happen to me. There is actually a correct answer to this. It depends. Why is that the correct answer? Um, well, first of all, it doesn't necessarily look like you're panicking. But also, it shows that you've been thinking about the problem. It shows that you've at least been imagining what might have gone through your head when this happens. And so this is the point of my talk. Imagining how you'll get hacked is how you protect yourself from getting hacked. This is my theme. If you take nothing else away, just kind of take that. It's not an exercise in masochism. It's absolutely critical for the safety of your application. And so this is what we're going to do today. We're going to basically take an imaginary web stack, a fairly typical design, and we're going to just start thinking about all the horrible things that can happen to it. It's going to be fun. It's just going to be like a litany of despair. The most important thing to realize about security is that it's not any one thing. There's no single security mechanism so clever that it stops all attacks from all attackers, except for one. Unplug the server, melt it down into slag, throw the slag in the ocean. And even then, the attacker will still nab the database backup you left behind on your workstation. <laughs> so there's more than one kind of attack, and you need to think about more than one kind of defense. A security system. A secure system relies on a lot of defenses in a lot of places. It's defense in depth. If you're thinking about one layer, you're already, it's, you've already lost. So you've got to start by thinking about who, who are you worried about? Who scares you? So who your opponents might be, who might be tempted to hack into your site, what their motivation is, what resources they have, and what skill level they might have. So I'm just going to run through a few brief examples just to start you thinking down these lines. Opportunistic script kitties. Who's played with Metasploit? It's fun, isn't it? Um, as long, if you're in view of the camera, don't put your hand up. Um, who's used it to break into a website? For the... <laughs> um, you are a script kitty. Congratulations. No. Um, so. They're unlikely to have a lot of financial resources. They're kind of playing with your system. They're doing it for fun. They're dangerous because they have all the time in the world, right? If you have a simple exploit in your website, something that lets them in, they'll find it because they're just going to keep at it because it's fun. They're in it for the lows. They're in it for, to make a name for themselves. They might just deface your website. They might just brag about it online. So that's sort of one pattern of behavior that you might see. Organized criminals are more interesting. Who, who has to deal with this in, in their day job? Is Roger in here? People who deal with banks, people who, hi, Roger. Why are you here? You know this stuff. Um, 
these guys have financial resources behind them. They can hire people to social engineer your call center. They can call someone up. They can make fake accounts, like bank accounts. They can actually do dangerous things. Um, and they have a plan. And they have a goal. Their goal is money. And that actually helps you predict what they're going to do. Because if you, make, if you can make life expensive for them, and if you can make life a little more expensive than what they might be able to earn, you win because they'll just go away and attack someone else. They don't have all the time in the world. They've got a business plan. Although they could just be dosing your site and blackmailing you, so that's. Disgruntled former employees. Who in this room is a disgruntled former, no. <laughs> so there's one thing that I really want to say. Like This is the top threat to information security. You, this is hard, and this is scary. You can't necessarily save yourself from this easily. And I'm really, really sorry, but this is a threat even if you are a lovely place to work. You can be the nicest company in the world, but you can't judge what's going on inside someone's head. If they walk away disgruntled, they walk away with the keys to the castle. <sighs> what are the, if you're good, maybe. Um, what are their means? They have intimate knowledge of the system. They probably know where the weak points are. They may have written the weak points in, or they may be angry because you refused to fix the weak points that they kept complaining about for, hi, who's the guy with, no. Um, <laughs> And what's their motive? Well, it, yeah, they're disgruntled. Sorry, that's, that's all they need. These guys want to make a political point by attacking you. So they may or may not have means. They may or may not be m motivated beyond that. It might be, yeah, we can move on from there. And nation state actors. This has been in the news a lot lately. If you're big enough that this is actually a threat to you, or if you're dangerous enough that this is an actual threat to you. Any advice that I give you probably isn't going to be good enough because I don't really know what I'm talking about. Um, they have infinite resources, and they probably don't have a ton of motivation for most of us in this room. For some of us in this room, this really is a threat. But for a lot of us, it's, it's kind of not. These are security personas. Who here works in an agile process with personas? Personas you use to like create a you create a person, and they have a motive, and they have a background. You even give them a name. You kind of get to know them, and you use them to sort of judge how they might interact with your system. I'm not really a UX expert, but um, you probably have made personas in the past for people trying to use your website in good faith. I would strongly urge you to start making personas of people who want to use your website in the worst faith. Start designing you know, potential attackers and use them in thought experiments when you're designing your system. So you, you get into their shoes. So as a brief example, um, at Catalyst, I worked for a project which was building a, a large project for the Ministry of Education in New Zealand. The attitude towards this project was somewhat polarized because of the relationship between teachers in New Zealand and the Ministry of Education. So there's a lot of interesting aspects to the threat model of a publicly funded, you know, government-built system for a group of, they're not public servants, but a group of people who might not be on good terms with them. So there could be political reasons for compromising the system. There could be people protesting by finding weaknesses in it. But the truth is, the number one threat of a system designed for use by teachers is teacher walks out of the room, laptop's on the table, student leans over and starts tapping away, right? So that's sort of the number one threat, just that simple, opportunistic whatever. Okay, so we've thought about our attackers a little bit. Let's start thinking about our system. I'm just gonna read the definition of attack service, like, like, a, like a ninth grade or third grade school report. Um, the attack surface is defined by Wikipedia as the attack surface of a software environment is the sum of the different points, the attack vectors, where an unauthorized user, the attacker, can try to enter data to or extract data from an environment. That basically means literally every kind of piece of interaction where they're sending anything or bringing anything back or making any change to your system, all of those bits are places where they can manipulate or try to find a weak point in your system. When you're talking about a fairly typical web stack, I'm not going into containerization much in this talk, but even with containerization, you're gonna have layers like this. You're gonna have a web server, you're gonna have an application server, 
you'll be talking to some kind of data store. You'll be talking to the, um, the there's the web browser side with the HTML and the JavaScript and all that stuff, which is basically its own layer, and then your actual hardware infrastructure. So I, for most of this talk, I'm going to be kind of just trolling through each of these layers and doing a little bit of thought of exp a little bit of a thought experiment on what's the worst thing that can happen to you at work. And you have to do this because if you think, uh, if you don't think about more than just the outermost layer, you're it's going to be devastating. You you if you go oh I have a firewall. Yeah no you need to think about more than that. So for each of these layers, I'm going to just talk about a little going down these sort of bullet points here. So how could this layer be compromised? By whom? What would happen? How can you help prevent it from happening? And if it does happen anyway, what can you have done to mitigate it? And it all boils down to, what will I wish I had done back when I had the chance? A little bit of preemptive hindsight is so much better. And so we'll talk about the web server first. Your web server is probably some combination of Apache or Nginx, right? Both have really large communities behind them. Both are mature and well-tested pieces of code. However, it's also obviously the most exposed part of your entire infrastructure. It will be hit by everything. Everything probably has to go through the web server to get to any other layer of the system. Any bugs discovered in either Apache or Nginx will be automated and exploited really quickly, just trolling the internet, looking for if there actually is like a buffer overrun or some kind of some kind of stack smash or anything, any kind of bug in the web server is just immediately your toast. Uh, and SSL bugs are the best example of that recently, right? We've been seeing those. Any SSL bug will be exploited, will be automated and exploited as just as soon as possible. Heartbleed, Poodle, these are useful, weird names. So how do you minimize the attack surface of your web server itself? Disable everything you're not using. In my experience, this is actually a lot easier with Nginx because Nginx kind of starts with quite a minimal configuration and you add bits that you're using, whereas on any standard distro, you install Apache and it comes with a whole ton of bells and whistles that you don't really realize you were using. You install mod PHP and PHP is enabled for literally every host of every directory you want and that's cool, but if you just installed it because you were installing you know, recommended Debian packages or whatever, you might not even realize it's there and on and functional. SSL configuration, I am enough of a crypto enthusiast to know that I must never try and implement my own crypto and just not to think that I'm an expert. So SSL configuration with web servers is hard and unless you have someone dedicated to this role and who really knows their stuff and probably wears a lot of black, um, you're better off finding some best practices to just use. So that URL there, it's pretty easy to Google for if you don't want to write down the URL. Uh, my slides are online later as well. But it gives you a, a good set of sensible defaults. And you get to choose if you're using Nginx and if you want the compatibility to be modern web browsers only and you can just lock down all the old things or if you need to be compatible with IE7 forward or something and that'll probably leave SSLv3 on, which you usually don't. Any don't want anymore, but it'll give you a decent configuration to stick to, and I think they keep it pretty well updated when the best practices change. If like a new hole is, or a weakness is found in a, in a crypto cipher, they'll, they'll get rid of it for you. So that's minimizing the attack surface. Mitigating a web server breach. If someone manages to hack your web server, like I said, it's probably some kind of stack smashing thing, it's probably some sort of C bug, and that means that they probably have code exec on your web server. So the best move you can possibly have is have your application server and everything else somewhere else. I'm a strong believer in making sure that your application server is not running on the same virtual machine or container or box as your actual web server. Operating system lockdown is really, really important too and really cool when you play with it. If you're, who's, who's used AppArmor or SE Linux? Cool. Um, I hadn't until not very long ago and it's actually really nice what it lets you do. You can, you, but I think it comes, I think the Apache one on Ubuntu comes with reasonably lax defaults, but you can lock them down really tight. So if an Apache process tries to access like any file 
off of what it's any, any file that other than like what you want it to, it'll just kill the process and you'll get a report, you'll get a log, you'll get whatever. And so locking down the application so that it can't do more than you expect it to, if your Apache process is just passing things to an application server in the back end, maybe it doesn't need to read from files in any directory, just lock it down tight. I think, I haven't played with SE Linux, but I think it's harder to configure, but that, that's a judgment call, I, I haven't played with it. But AppArmor is actually pretty easy to go. In all these directories, if it tries to touch something, kill it. Strict firewalling. Firewalling is a good idea. Egress firewalling. Your web server should not be able to talk to the internet. Why does it need to be able to talk to the internet? If you have a web server kill all of its outgoing ports, it might need to talk to your update server your package update server, your Ubuntu mirror or whatever. It might need to talk to your logging mirror or your logging server if you have one. It obviously needs to talk to your application servers if it needs to. And it, you, it needs to be able to let in SSH and HTTP and nothing else. Lock down everything else. Find out when it's trying to talk to the outside internet. Just don't let people who get a foothold on your web server get any further. Yeah, that one. So. You want to, yeah, you want to know in a hurry whether that's happened to you or not. But let's talk about your application server, because that's kind of an interesting place. Because application servers are usually written in sort of a high-level language, you're probably writing them in, if you're me, you're writing them in sort of Python or Ruby. Um, if you're writing in a high-level language, you don't usually have to worry about buffer overrun attacks, usually. An attacker could still achieve arbitrary code ex execution on the server if you have some issues with your app server. Imagine if you're using any system commands, like let's say you're doing image manipulation and you're shelling out with your application server to talk to ImageMagick or some external tool that you need to use for some piece of whatever you're doing. If you're not careful with that, you run the risk of letting people directly compromise the, 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 the server that it's running on. That'll happen if you're doing something interesting like shelling out. The more likely direct attacks against your application server code probably involve compromised login credentials, right? A man in the middle attack or a compromised computer that someone logs in with, they might get a hold of login credentials to whatever your application is. They could possibly get a hold of admin credentials to whatever your system is. Um, for example, if you manage to steal an account for a Django admin user in a Django system and you log in as admin, you probably have basically global access to everything. Django by default exposes the entire database. Um, there could also be indirect attacks on your application using cross-site scripting or something like that, but we'll cover that in a little bit. So mitigating a code execution attack. Reduce the execution privileges of your app server. Make sure that it can't do anything. If your app server can be owned, can be run by the nobody process and it doesn't have to talk to the file system, that's awesome. App Armor profiles again. If your application server is running in a thing and it doesn't, it talks to a database server and maybe it reads a couple static files off the thing, it doesn't need to do much else and you can actually lock it down so that it can't, can't so that it literally can't do anything else. If you're, if you're lucky, and if you're doing you know, 12-factor app type stuff, it doesn't need to write to any files on the system at all. It'll use our syslog for logging, or it'll log to standard out like a 12-factor app. It'll talk to images and static assets on S3 or some sort of storage as a service thing. It'll talk to a database through another network connection. Maybe it doesn't need to be able to write to any files at all. That one's still a good idea. Always do that. Prevent it from being able to do anything even if they break in. If they get that far, if they manage to nab your credentials, it's generally speaking with any modern framework really easy to implement IP address whitelisting on admin accounts and I would strongly recommend that. Two-factor authentication is also pretty easy. I think there's a simple plugin that does it in Django. There's probably an even simpler plugin that does it in Ruby. I hate to admit that but it probably is a lot easier. So what are the consequences of an application server breach? It's not pretty. You probably have to assume that your entire data store has been compromised. You, because the application server, even if they didn't get an admin credential, if they've got code exec on that, they can probably read 
the configuration file for the connection to the database and execute code to connect to your database and pull all your data. Customer information could be lost or tampered with. Tamper is more interesting. There's leaking data is one thing, but messing with it's a bit nasty. Incident response and forensics will become critical. You'll need to be able to, as much as possible, determine the timeline and the extent of the breach. If they're tampering with things and your log files are there, they were in a writable file, they're tampering with that. Yeah. It is fun to just sort of think about just how horrible this can get, isn't it? What about your database? The database is sort of sitting behind that. It should be really hard to talk to. It should be safe. Who's familiar with, who, who's familiar with SQL injection? Basically everybody. That's good. If you're not familiar with SQL injection, Google it. Google the OWASP top 10. If you're, this is probably the harshest thing to say, but it's kind of true. If, if you're a web developer and you're not familiar with the OWASP top 10, you're a liability to your project and you're a liability to your company. And don't feel bad because you can fix this. Google the OWASP top 10, read it all. Read that up, that's, that's homework for, for everybody. In fact, all of you who know what SQL injection is, read up on it again, it's good stuff. If there's an SQL injection vulnerability in your application code, you can compromise the database without requiring a compromise of the application server. You just go right through. But there's other less obvious but devastating ways to kind of get to your database. The database could be exposed through lateral movement inside your network if they got to somewhere else. The database backups could be compromised. Much more likely is the database could get compromised on a staging environment or a developer environment or if they're using a copy of production data on an environment that is treated as non-production, so like it's a little bit more lax. Um, this happened to Patreon a month or two ago and it was quite troubling. Well, the thing that happened to Patreon is interesting. I'll talk, I can talk about that later if you're, if you're interested. But attackers got a copy of production data without having to touch production is the key, is the key threat there. Okay, so you wanna minimize the attack surface of the database. Reduce the privileges of the account used by the app. Make sure it can't do much more than it needs to do. That's actually a little bit fiddly if you're using something like Django or Ruby where part of the workflow of working with a Django or Ruby app, for example, is creating the database and creating the database tables. So you have to give it some permissions. But for God's sake, don't give it admin permissions. If the user account that your Django app is using to talk to your database has admin, obviously it has full power to manipulate your database but also with both MySQL and Postgres, it's really trivial to go from there to a shell because the admin user of Postgres, for example, can load a Postgres extension and those Postgres extensions can be like run Python code, the Python code isn't in a sandbox, you get a shell. You can probably just like load a bash extension. I'll bet, I'll bet there's some way of running bash code in a SQL query. If there is, tell me, and if there is, don't do it. <laughs> Find a way to not use production data or production database dumps on development servers. Make fake data. Scramble the data. You, you, you probably have to have production data in like a pre-prod environment when you're doing final testing, but don't put your hands up, but do look a little sheepish for a moment if you have a copy of production database on your laptop in this room. Someone does, someone does, but I'm not gonna look, I'm not gonna look, and don't put your hand up. And hopefully your laptop is at least encrypted. <laughs> and never ever allow code with the potential for SQL injection into your app. This is why I want you to Google it, because it's educable and it's fixable. SQL injection is the number one vulnerability in the, in the OWASP top 10, and there's no excuse for that anymore. Every database interface library that you might use in any language has parameterized binding for SQL queries. This is, this is, of all of the security issues in the security world, this is the fixable one. We can totally eliminate SQL injection. All you have to do is know one thing that you shouldn't do. That thing, if you haven't Googled yet and you're unfamiliar, is if you're building an SQL statement out of a couple strings, 
and you're sort of adding them together and then running them as an SQL statement, that should be a red flag. You should go, oh, why is he saying don't do that? I better Google this. I'll leave it at there. Always know where your database dumps live. How, who's got those in your home directory? Who's got those in the home directory of the production server from that time they were doing a migration and wanted to check and then like, I love the uncomfortable chuckles. It's like, <laughs> it's, the only, it's, it's the reason I give this talk. Okay, what are the consequences of a database breach? Obviously the data is breached. Probably full leak or loss or tampering of the data, kind of like with the application server. If the application server is being used with an admin user, that probably means they have shell on your database. So yeah, start thinking about writing that letter to your customers where you say, where you offer them free credit monitoring. Okay, so let's get back a step and just talk about the web browser layer. I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because cross-site scripting attacks are actually a massive topic of their own right. Um, and I love talking about them because this one's hard to solve. The canonical example of cross-site scripting, if you're unfamiliar with it, is one user on your website adds like a comment or something and it has some JavaScript in it and then the next time someone else goes to that website, it runs their JavaScript. And that sounds bad, but it's actually far worse than bad. It's freaking terrible because you end up with People have written nice little frameworks where if you can get a little bit of JavaScript in, you can get this whole operating system which will turn your computer into a botnet. It'll give them access to your web browser and let them do whatever they want as you logged in on Facebook or wherever else you are. Um, look up beef if you want to be frightened. Beef is an interest. is it beef? I forget. Yep, Beef is a cross-site scripting framework, kind of like Metasploit, where if you get a little bit of JavaScript in, then you can do a lot of bad things. Now, this is something that you should also read up on in terms of just mitigation by escaping code that goes onto your page. I'm not gonna cover that, but I'm gonna cover a cool mitigation called content security policy in a second. Um, what are the consequences of this? So it could be site defacement, just like you know, putting an alert box in or putting a, you know, you were hack sword. Um, it could be used to attack the users of your site, compromising their accounts or taking actions in their name. So that's the most common thing. You, you're a, someone else is using your site to attack your users, and one of your users is your admin user, right? And that person is logged in as admin. So if that person goes to the defaced page, then that piece of JavaScript, the first thing it'll do is go, oh yep, someone's on this page. Let's see what they're logged in as. Ooh, they can access the Django admin section. Let's start playing in there. So a cross-site scripting attack could attack the admin of the site when they go to investigate the cross-site scripting that someone was telling, telling them was on their site, use their account to create a new admin user on the site, which then the other person can log in as. So how do you minimize the attack surface? Every framework that you might write web code in lets you escape text before it goes onto the page to make it safe. But you always want to do whitelist input validation on all user-generated input. That sentence right there also is kind of the key thing in pretty much every security talk that any security person will ever tell you. They'll say, do whitelist input validation on all user-generated input. And they'll say it, and they'll say it, and they'll say it, and they'll say it, and they'll cry, and they'll cry, and they'll cry, and they'll cry. <laughs> and that's basically like the whole security industry. It must be billions and billions of dollars. But if you just did whitelist input validation on all user-generated input all the time, you can put them all out of business and laugh and laugh. Who's heard of content security policy? Not very many of you. Many of you. Who's, a web, who's a web developer who hasn't, dealt with, who hasn't played with content security policy? This isn't me, oh, okay, well. Um, Content security policy is awesome. It's one of my favorite things right now. It's an HTTP response header. Your app server just puts it into the response along with the page, and it tells the browser what it's allowed to do on that page and where it's allowed to load code from. So content security policy can say, oh, this web page is only allowed to run JavaScript from our content delivery network, not from any other place. And even better, content security policy can say, this page is not allowed to run any inline JavaScript at all. And then nothing that the attacker can do can touch you anymore because they're trying to insert JavaScript into your page, but you've just told the browser to turn off the JavaScript interpreter on the page. So the JavaScript 
the only JavaScript that it will load is stuff loaded from separate files, and you can tell it where those files come from. It's amazing, and not just JavaScript. It can be images, it can be fonts, it can be basically any kind of interactive object on your web page. So yeah, one of the key default settings in content security policy is inline JavaScript won't get executed. So if you, if you have an existing site, this is a real pain, because if you have an existing site, you probably have inline JavaScript. It's just kind of one of those things that exists. But if you're building a new site, if you're building a Greenfields website, you're building a new product, start with this really, really restricted and say, all of my JavaScript is gonna come from JavaScript files, not inline JavaScript, and turn on a strong content security policy and you'll be golden, it's wonderful. It, it's a lot of work in an existing app, but if you start with a new one and you say, no inline JavaScript for me, one language per file, which is a great rule, by the way, It'll be awesome. It's only a mitigation, not a cure, because only modern web browsers support content security policy. So you can't do this and go, oh, I don't need to escape my input anymore, because everyone with old browsers will still be in trouble. Um, and by recent, I mean anything IE8 up. So if you're using an open source browser, you're fine. If you're using IE these days, you're probably fine. If you're still using XP, you're in trouble. But you already are. So it's, this is definitely an example of defense in depth. It's a layer that's useful, but it's not a cure on its own. But content security policy has this other thing, which is content security policy violation reports. Who's familiar with those? This is awesome, too, because if there's a violation to the policy, like if someone inserted JavaScript code into your web page, and a browser that supports content security policy goes there and says, my policy says I'm not allowed to run JavaScript, but here's some JavaScript, I'll tell the web server and it sends a little JSON packet up to the web server at a location you specify, and it'll tell you, hey, there's a violation of your content security policy right here. The policy that was violated was inline JavaScript, and you can go, oh, someone's done something they shouldn't have. And so suddenly, all of your users' modern web browsers become your allies. They become the, 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 the um, narcs. Okay, that stuff's all really easy, right? Like, yeah, security is a solved problem. This is boring. I'm the last man standing between you and beer. Let's make this a little more fun. What if someone got into your infrastructure as a service keys? How could this possibly happen? <laughs> Don't put your hands up. But blush and look at the floor if you've ever committed your AWS keys to GitHub. It turns out this happens all the time. Automated scanners are constantly searching public repositories in GitHub, Stack Overflow, all paste bins, looking for strings like begin private key and AWS secret key and AWS license or, or whatever it is, and any of 100 different key phrases. They're looking for those. They're automated. They're doing it all the time. It's gotten so bad that Amazon have their own bots constantly scanning the same parts of the internet in order to quickly lock down any keys that they find before the bad guys find them. What are the consequences? Who wants to think about this for a second? It, 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 well, so this is the good news, is that this happens all the time, but it must actually be a gigantic relief that most of the time, the automated scanners will just use your account to spin up a 1,000 machines and do Bitcoin mining. <laughs> so if you're really, really, really lucky, it's just a stupid robot that's found your key. But if it's someone who's actually like targeting you, then they're in, and that's not going to be pretty. Are your backups on S3 as well? <laughs> okay, so minimizing your attack surface. AWS lets you make subkeys. To my embarrassment, for my own personal projects, I haven't played with this yet. I still just have like the main key, and I hope it doesn't get into. But if you if you use AWS in anger professionally, you probably have subkeys with 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 fewer privileges, and the master key should be locked in a vault and guarded by dogs. Mean dogs.
and with two-factor authentication. Dogs with two-factor authentication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so your database, is in, your database is in RDS, and your backups are in S3, and your, your, your elastic beanstalk is, is beaning away. Just please, for the love of God, for me, don't have all your eggs in one basket. Have, have it somewhere else. Final topic. What will I wish I had done back when I had the chance? Just going back into that hindsight thing. You're going to wish you had better logging than you do. If your log servers are on the machine that's compromised, you can't trust them. One of the most important steps after an incident is to reconstruct what happened. But unless you've got those basic steps, it's also the hardest, especially if it was six months ago, and that is what happens. It's, the reality is sometimes you'll get a phone call from someone else, and they'll say, hey, why is your server sent 16 gigabytes of data to my company? And you'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> and that's when you'll find out, and that's literally what happened to me one time. Logs are absolutely one of those things that you can't wish you had kept more of after they're already gone. I want you to assume, I want you to assume that your backups have not worked since the last time you tested a full restore. Modern cloud orchestration has actually made, has actually had like a really profound benefit that if you're doing that clever, you know, um, immutable architecture thing, you're often rebuilding your servers and rebuilding your data. So you, you, that sort of infrastructure automation might mean that your data is a bit safer, but where does your core data live and how do you get it back? Your backups are only as good as your last test restore and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You, you've got to prove that the system works. So, yeah, to prevent the worst, you've got to plan for the worst. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs>